Hello, everyone. I'm Tim Ebner. I'm Custom Strategies Content Editor for Government Executive Media Group. Thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's ViewCast, uh, Government Data and Applications, How to Build a Strategy for Migrating to the Cloud. Events today wouldn't be possible without the support of our underwriters, so I'd like to take a moment to thank them. Uh, today's underwriter for today's ViewCast is Red Hat. This afternoon, you'll hear from uh, chances and challenges and opportunities that cloud offers and provides, um, and how government agencies like the Department of Transportation and Veteran Affairs are building foundational strategies for successful migration of data and applications to the cloud. To that end, today's event and viewcast, I'll turn you to our viewers and address some of our questions, uh, which we'll ask you at the end of this discussion. Please submit your questions to us using uh, Twitter. You can tweet at us during the discussion using the hashtag GovCloudMigration, gov again, GovCloudMigration. And the hashtag will also be displayed at the bottom of the screen today as you watch. Tomorrow, we'll send an email with a few links to the recorded conversation. And it'll also be available for the next three months. Please feel free to forward the link to anyone you may feel might be interested in today's viewcast. And now I'd like to introduce some of our speakers. Today, I'm here with Maria Rote. She's the Chief Technology Officer for the Department of Transportation and also Dr. Joseph Ronzio, the Special Assistant to the Chief Health Technology Officer for the Department of Federal Affairs. Finally, I'm joined by Adam Clater, the Director of Cloud Strategy and Solution Architect Manager for the U.S. Civilian and National Security Program at Red Hat. Before we get deeper into the discussion, I want to give each of you a chance uh, to just kind of update us on your backgrounds and tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing. So Maria, let's start with you and tell us a little bit about what you're up to. Thanks, Tim. Um, I started out as the Chief Technology Officer back in September this past year, so it's not been quite six months yet. Um, a big part of my job is, is really with the department looking forward, looking two, three, four years downstream and really trying to pull and look at an enterprise approach across the department. Prior to that, I, uh, I spent 10 years at DHS, previously as the FedRAMP Director for about a year and a half. Joe, how about you? At the moment, uh, for the past two years, I've been the special assistant to the chief health technology officer, who's Mr. Craig Lugart. So dealing with him, we're concentrating on how we can utilize uh, bio devices and sensors predominantly to improve healthcare. So it's been very interesting as we're trying to develop, we're trying to get bleeding edge within the VA so that we can actually prevent individuals from exacerbating their medical condition or even getting sick to begin with. So the goal is really to keep the population healthy as a whole by utilizing information technologies, um, sensors, and capabilities to utilize predictive analytics. And Adam, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been at Red Hat for four years. Before that, I've been at a variety of agencies and commercial uh, uh, enterprises around the Beltway, um, either as an architect or a system administrator. Um, and really the best part of sort of the day-to-day -day job that we have at Red Hat is getting to work with you know, partners in industry and, and within the government, um, moving a lot of these goals forward and really helping them get to the next generation of IT. So Maria, I want to start with you uh, because at Department of Transportation, you guys are in the process of implementation um, sort of as you go here. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, some of the challenges involved in implementing a cl cloud migration sort of as it's going on uh, live? Yeah, we're right now across the department, there's probably about 30 things going on around the cloud, 30 instances, if you will, where people have migrated to the cloud, they're thinking about it, maybe uh, they're in the contracting phase, so there's about 30 things that are going on. And, you know, really the, the, the plane's taking off and we're throwing parts on it as we go. Just a lot of activity in this space. And on top of that, we're trying to build out a cloud strategy for the department as a whole. So really trying to get our arms around that. So. Part of the challenge is, you know, working around our enterprise architecture. You know, we're gathering the roadmaps from all of our modes across the whole department, where they're headed on architecture. And it's really a big planning effort because as you're looking at the roadmap, we're developing the enterprise roadmap. At the same time, you've got people that are already moving into the cloud. So that big challenge is, you know, aligning a lot of that planning and we're trying where we're headed on our roadmap with everything else that's happening at the same time. So that's a that's a big challenge in that alignment. And Joe, you guys are sort of, I think, one of the early adopters here. Um, tell us about your experiences so far at Veterans Affairs. Obviously, um, healthcare, uh, that sort of uh, whole sector is sort of pushing the way, I think, with cloud migration. Talk about that. Well, it's been very interesting. As we're getting into it today, and looking back on where we came from, 
and again within my private industry background for 20 years of IT implementation for large companies as we're moving forward it's very it's very important to define what you're talking about when you're talking about cloud. Is this lease services? Is this just infrastructure that you're going to then partition up and divvy up internally? Are you going to have some data internal to your data center and architecture and some data external? So defining that is critical. But even at the higher level, Gartner's already stated that you're not going to save money by going to any of these cloud platforms today. There's no cost savings. It may get you some speed. So that's what we've seen in the VA so far, is that we've had some challenges, that's <laughs> public knowledge, um, but as we move forward, we've been very successful at specific things. So our innovations program utilizes multiple cloud platforms, both internal to the VA and external, for dynamic allocation of resources. That has worked extremely well as we have projects that might start off really, really small and grow in size to do, again, clinical informatics, bioanalytics, and different facets of our business. So when Mr. Lugart was the CIO for the VA, well, the, the Veterans Health Administration side of it, um, he actually ended up starting the innovations programs within the VHA so that it had a very low bar of entry and a very high bar to get out. So we'll give you resources and we give you capability, but to actually make it so that you were in production utilizing production resources across the United States that became very difficult to get out and had to meet all of the requirements. And then I guess, so Adam, the bigger picture here, um, just sort of your experience from government organizations and agencies, how do you know when you're ready to move into the cloud environment? Uh, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it, when we have these conversations with customers, the first thing I ask is, you know, what does cloud mean to you today, right? Because it's a very point in time sort of evaluation. and, and it really figures into where you're going, but you need to have an idea of what you want to do um, today and, and why you have sort of this drive to embrace uh, a cloud technology, right? I think the good news is, you know, while most agencies don't have an application that could be moved onto a cloud platform immediately, for the most part, most web-based applications that have been written in the last five or so years that live behind a load balancer, maybe they're written in Java, they're pretty close, right? So if we can help agencies sort of cover that last 25% of cloudifying that application, get it into a dynamic environment, um, they can begin to show some of the, the benefits uh, fairly quickly. And uh, so I want to get down to specifics here. Um, obviously with applications um, and services that um, you guys are using and moving into the cloud environment, can you talk about a little bit of, about those um, previous and current projects, I guess, that you're working on right now? Yeah, um, I, I know from our perspective, you know, there's a, a few things that we're looking at and taking an enterprise approach to to it. We've got uh, we're looking at a geospatial application right now. You know, the hardware is old. The application itself is probably four revisions behind. We've already laid out the architecture and worked through that says, okay, as we're going to move this application to the cloud because it's so old and so behind, how are we going to do that? Are we going to go infrastructure as a service? Are we going to go with platform? So as we're looking at the architecture, you know, it, the, 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 the owner of that system really needs to think through how they're going to do it. And because the system's so old now, they wanna make, we want to make sure that we're going to take, um, you know, uh, take advantage of the cloud capabilities because you just don't want to throw an old app out there. You want to upgrade it as you go. You want to take advantage of the cloud capabilities and not just throw something out there. So we are working through the architecture right now, and we actually have done that. We're looking at... Um, both the infrastructure platform as a service piece of it, and then we would maintain the uh, software right now until software as a service becomes available for this particular application. And then, you know, the system owner says, hmm, I may want to go software as a service for this particular app. But this will be the first one, and as we take an enterprise approach to geospatial, you know, part of our challenge is we've done a data inventory across the department is, you know, we have copies of data all over the place, and when you start talking about geospatial, spatially enabled data, and you've got copies all over, you really need to think about the layering and you know what that source data is. You want to make sure that as we're consolidating and taking that enterprise approach that while this is the first step, we're keeping in mind all the rest of it. And as things are getting developed, we're noticing it that you have to be very clear on your contracts. So that's one of the things in government we worry about a little bit more than I used to in private industry to make sure that you're very specific. So 
that becomes very difficult as you talk about dyna dynamic development environments and again dynamic applications but you may need sub second one second response times for specific applications especially as we move towards customer generated data customer application facing so having those contracts that state those requirements or that allow you to have flexibility in those requirements so that you can dynamically allocate are important the last piece is as you're working within a cloud infrastructure you definitely need that exit plan on day one. Most of the way that things were developed in IT were pretty much under the idea that somebody was gonna come into your environment, develop something, install something, do something, and then it becomes the organization's issue. As you go outside and you start utilizing lease services, you've gotta have an entry point and an exit point because contracts are gonna change every three, five, or 10 years. We're that calling it. We're calling it a move strategy, <laughs> not an exit strategy. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Strategy is obviously a key here. Um, talk about that a little bit. I mean, Maria, you have a kind of working group now focused on strategy, um, but what? It, as long as the strategy is involved, what does that actually entail? Wow. So you know, while I said that we've got 30 instances of things that are already going on around the cloud, and now we want to build a cloud strategy because there isn't one in place. There isn't the governance. There isn't the you know, the process to determine what goes into the cloud. So we're building out a cloud strategy. One of the first things that um, I did, this was back in December, was pull the team together and say, you know what, we did a SWOT analysis actually, to really draw out of everybody to say, what, what worked as you're moving through the process, whether you've already moved to the cloud, you're in contracts, what's, to, to really draw that out. And that kind of laid the foundation for um, a lot of the, the strategy itself. And as we're developing what those goals, the vision, the objectives are, that, that SWOT analysis really fed that, and I'm trying to lean forward, really think about you know agile development, think about DevOps, think about innovation sandbox, and really, you know, as as people are thinking about the cloud, not just today, but looking forward. And I guess with strategy, yours was sort of. Uh, kind of in play from day one, was it not? How, how did you kind of go about forming that, I guess? Well, we have a lot of data governance structure within the VA because of the nature of how our electronic medical reporting system got implemented. So th again, that was a groundswell effort back in the 80s for individuals to have EMR access. So we have a rather rigid government structure already in place that allows the 150 medical centers and healthcare systems around the United States to collaborate to move things forward. but it's been very difficult to move a ship in a different direction because they're so used to having local controls that to have anything go on centrally becomes a little bit of a challenge. To have standards that everyone's going to universally apply becomes a little bit of a challenge because there's always that little widget. Somebody wants it one facility that the next person not, doesn't necessarily want. But we've gotten really good at deconflicting that. We've uh, apparently had some meetings of the minds. We've actually built some good subwork groups. We've allowed certain variances, and we've actually developed centers of excellence for different data strategies. So as things move forward, we can actually implement at one facility and roll across internally a little bit slowly today. Hopefully we're starting to observe some of those agile methodologies better. We've got um, different individuals that have actually been experts in the field that have consulted. Um, again, a lot of that's in the press right now. So as we keep moving things forward, I see that we're going to actually move in the right direction. And Adam, what are some of the most popular models, I guess, uh, for cloud adoption right now? I think, you know, you, you talk about the workloads of government and matching that up with cloud solutions. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, the good news is sort of with all this cloud adoption conversation is, you know, it's 2015, we're all fairly comfortable with this idea of virtualization and I'm gonna virtualize workloads and I'm gonna be able to move them. And so virtualization is really the first step towards moving into sort of an infrastructure as a service cloud, right? Whether that be, on-prem within your own data center, or maybe something that you're doing uh, in a private cloud provider, or even in a community cloud, right? Um, so that's really step one. The, the other service model that people are, are really comfortable with is the idea of like software as a service, right? Which, which we spoke about, which, you know, Gmail, that's really a software as a service, right? It's email software as a service, you use it. You don't talk to Gmail about what kind of server they're running on, or what operating system they're running on, or even what it's written in. You just know that I log into Gmail, I get my mail, I send mail, they filter spam, and it's a very clear sort of line of delineation. Uh, the other model that we see really approaching um, velocity at this point is a platform as a service, right? And that's where you provide the underlying infrastructure to your software development teams, uh, and they have the ability to uh, build up a platform for development of their application and have auto-scaling and failover of that application, and they're not concerned about 
what's running underneath, right? They know that they need to write an application to service a business need. The platform as a service provides that. Really what a platform as a service allows you to do is turn your industry or, or your agency into a software as a service provider, right? So that's where we're seeing. I go about thinking, you know, how do you measure success of your programs or, you know, success of a migration? Can you talk about the, the benchmarking, maybe the success metrics you're, you're tracking or keeping up to date on? The best is going to be use. I mean, if, you're, if your actual customers are utilizing it and they're happy with it, so you do have to have some interaction, ask them, put things for surveys in really obvious spots so they don't have to dig for them. The, the use is what's going to drive them, same as it does in mobile applications today. A lot of people just on their iPhone alone download an application, test it out. Either I like it or I don't, and the, the use drives your success, and that's where we need to look for in the future. So if you roll out software such as an email application and people aren't utilizing it, then you obviously failed at that point. Um, if they are utilizing it, well, how can you make it better? Google does a very good job of that of constantly evaluating what widgets they need to add, what things people are going to look for. And that's where we need to go. We need to move further in that direction so that we can actually provide for our employees and our customers the information they need at the time they need it, in the way that they need it. And it needs to be information, not just data. So for medical providers, I can't just shove an entire medical record in their face and expect them to read hundreds of pages of record. I need to figure out how to elevate important pieces of information through analytics and other types of engines. And this is where a lot of our innovation programs start to happen because people start to say, well, I need to do X to make my work easier. I need to save time. And again, the old Toyota model, if I could save one second on the assembly line for every car assembled, that's worth retooling the line. With IT, if you, in some levels, if you save a fraction of a second, j just even count it. If you get a billion emails and I can save a fraction of a second to process an email, that has massive returns on investment for your user population and how you process things. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's where we try to concentrate on at least. And we were talking about, before we came in, sort of don't be afraid to fail, right? It's not just about success. It's really about learning a lot of this. Um, and so there are lots of failures, sort of big picture, big failures within government that we all hear about, we all know about, and those are actually pretty bad. Uh, but the small failures where you learn from them and you're able to move your organization forward or your development forward. Yeah, and that's where I'm, you know, we've talked about, it was one of the things when I first came in, I put on my whiteboard, I've got a whole list of projects, <laughs> I put innovations, you know, a sandbox. That's right. Because I really think that, you know, giving people the opportunity, whether it's, you know, four hours a week or something like that. You know, I have a list of projects, and if you want something to tackle and I make that available, you know, you give them some guidelines and say, here you go, here's this. And then how do you take that if something works, you know? If it doesn't work, okay, go try something else. It's still a success That's because right. you tested it and it didn't work. Go try something else if it doesn't. And if it works, ah, you know what? How do I get it from that sandbox into production? Exactly. But I still have to meet all the governance hoops and all that stuff. I think I make my <laughs> governance folks nervous, but um, <laughs> I get it. I understand it, so don't don't get me wrong on that. But be able to move very quickly from that innovation, move it into production. And and there's some big projects we're looking at that I that I say, you know what? We can bite this off in little chunks, try mm -hmm. little pieces, get it into production, and really accelerate. And that's where again. The, the cloud formats and the systems work very well today because you can try an innovation low cost. Um, I mean, multiple vendors are out there who can provide you a sandbox area. You can buy into it. Again, a little bit of CPU, a little bit of memory, a little bit of disk. Roll forward and keep throwing more resources at it as it shows benefit, and then move it to kind of pseudo production, showing some benefit, making sure that all your security wrappers and containers work correctly, right. which are always the right. nightmare of everybody. The, the FIPS rules drive us all nuts, um, even though they have some very good value, and there's a lot of people that adhere to them and don't know it. <laughs> um, but And then throw it into, again, a public access capability, and then once it becomes part of your business, you have some strong decisions to make. Of Do I keep it in that cloud environment and I keep other people maintaining it for me, or do I bring it into my, my small book of IT business and I make that a true business line or a true capability for my business and architecture, and then I've got to decide, of do I keep it in cloud? Do I keep it in a service? Do I just dedicate lots of resources to it? But you, you'll have learned throughout the process what that footprint is. So mm -hmm. as we see a lot of things going on right now within biosensors, we're noticing smaller and smaller footprints because the mobile devices take on the lion's share of it. 
I always have to laugh because if you look at IT statistics, I remember back in the early 90s paying hundreds of dollars to get one hour on a Cray supercomputer. Today, a iPad, uh, any modern generation iPad is actually 4,000 times more powerful than a Cray supercomputer was then. So just the thinking of the iPhone and iPad and the capability we carry around in our pocket, well, if you can push things out and allow your computing power that's distributed to do some of that work, it has tremendous return on investment. And I think so, obviously, when we talk um, records and data, s security has to be top of mind here. Uh, I guess, probably, Joe, in your experience, medical records, very sensitive stuff. Um, tell me a little bit about that, um, how security goes into all of this, uh, especially with FedRAMP and sort of um, the evolving nature and what, it, what that involves, yeah. So again, we're, I live and die by FIPS 140-2. <laughs> when they come up with the three standard, then I'll say FIPS 140-3. But every encryption algorithm from start to finish needs to have a positive encryption handshake. It needs to be able to talk. It needs to protect data at rest and data in transit. But it's amazing what pieces of data that isn't really data today. A lot of telecommunications actually isn't governed by encryption. We don't have encrypted phones. Um, a lot of capabilities can be stored at the smallest level and meet all those standards. Um, an iPad and an, I and an iPhone along with many Android phones actually all meet that layer. So we can actually utilize a lot of portable devices to get forward with a lot of back-end infrastructure. I, I know all of the encryption requirements that Red Hat, along with others, keeps. So it's not as hard today as it was years ago where we, to plug in an encryption algorithm, get that communication to work was actually really difficult. Today it's more of a select, select, select. Um, whatever vendor you're utilizing, you check those boxes, and then you disable some of the stuff that could allow people in. <laughs> When you talk about FedRAMP in general, you know, it being at transportation after, you know, a year and a half run of the FedRAMP program, you know, just making sure that people understand, you know, the layers and how they inherit controls and what the boundaries look like. And when you start moving into hybrid solutions around cloud, whether it's your internal private cloud, you know, if you're using MPLS connecting to something else, you know, an external cloud, how are you bringing all that together with infrastructure, infrastructure platform, and maybe a software sitting on top of that. But you know, understanding FedRAMP, the security, the controls, where where the boundary of one ends, where the the, the boundary of the next one begins, is is I think a, a challenge for the security people, and just wrapping their heads around that they can use an authorization that somebody else um, did, they can leverage that. Yet they need to review it, and they still need to do the letter. But just understanding that, so I think there's still some education that needs to go on in that space. I know I sit with our folks, the security folks, and answer questions. But sometimes there is some fear that if I didn't certify it, if I didn't do it, it doesn't necessarily cover to other people. Yeah. So we, we've got to get a little bit beyond that. NIST yep. does a good job of making sure the encryption algorithms work. You obviously want to read and see if there's any known problems or what does things step on so that if there becomes a root problem, as there was recently uh, last year where one of the encryption algorithms was compromised, that, that you can move forward. Mm -hmm. But that's, uh, it's not insurmountable anymore. Yeah. And Adam, is the security the conversation you're having, I guess, what, from it, your perspective? What's yeah, it's like? absolutely huge. Um, you know, for, for Red Hat especially, we spend a lot of time and effort in making sure that the implementations that we give over to our government customers have those certifications, right? And what's interesting is the, those certifications, whether it be common criteria or FIPS 140, variety of those, those are really, um, they're as much about the bits and the actual software that we're giving you as they are about how they were made, right? Mm -hmm. And how we went about creating those bits. So you want to make sure that sort of as you're entering into these cloud arenas, you're working with a vendor who's supporting your software and who's getting those certifications for you. They're not inherited simply by being part of an open source community. Mm -hmm. Though great work and efforts go on there, um, those standards are specific to those implementations. Um, so yeah, absolutely, and whether it be you know, like container security, containers are pretty hot. Uh, we spend a lot of time working with the guys from Docker, getting SE Linux enabled around their container implementation, uh, making it consumable for government, right? Making it something that you could, you could bet your career on. And I, I think that's what we're doing every day, right? Is we're making these wagers that are our careers, that we're gonna do what's right by the taxpayers. I guess so workforce comes into play here as an issue too. Um, you know, obviously you talk about your IT department, how cloud uh, services can change that. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit and maybe start with you, uh, Joe, how uh, your services have changed through time as you have begun to use cloud as a service. 
They haven't changed yet. So we've actually been, like I said, innovation's a big part. So we've, we're kind of having this tidal wave come through um, now as things are moved. Now, I don't work for the IT arm. I actually work for health administration. So as we're trying to move different things in play, it's actually starting to build more and more and more. Um, the IT arm is also working with FedRAMP and working with other people to build things out and so that we can get to different services and support our initiatives on the back end. But that's just it, is that it's kind of a, a dull roar building into a tidal wave because people are starting to want more flexibility and more dynamic capability. That's where I see a lot of our programs going. Um, it, on today, I might not have I might have five second response time, and people are complaining about it. Well, I need to be able to throw more resources at it and get it down to three second response times. So, how do you do that? And then, how do you again scale it across an entire enterprise? Will the mission critical work of government get to cloud? Is that is that happening, or will that happen in the future? From my perspective, it's happening in specific areas. Um, uh, you have to make those decisions, though. Not everything is going to be ideal for cloud. Specific things that you want to include as your complete book of business, things that are that big, that large, or that important to your business, you need to have different controls than your other pla your cloud platforms are going to do for you today. That doesn't mean that five years from now things won't change. In fact, I often tell vendors, tell me where we're going to be in 10 years so that we can work together on it now so that five years from now I can start implementation and then it'll take five years to get done completely. But the PA is kind of big. <laughs> I want to go back to the workforce question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think as an organization, you know, as a department, you know, looking at your workforce as a whole and really thinking through how are the skill sets that are needed to support cloud different than what we have today. And I think there needs to be a lot more, uh, more of a focus on, you know, I'm not going to need maybe these administrators anymore, that I really need people that are innovative, creative, that, that, that can adapt to changing technologies. Maybe I don't need that administrator. I still need the technologist, but that skill set's going to change, and I think people need to really look, um, not tomorrow, but look out next year and the year and year after that and really do some strategic planning around the workforce. And I don't know that, that that's being done all over the place. It just, it's important. You were saying people, people come to you all the time and ask about that, right? Or they're asking about strategy for the future and how you're doing it. Is that, is that right? Yeah, because part of my job is really, you know, coming on board the CIO says, you got to help me look forward, you know, and while I'm not responsible for the workforce, I'm also cognizant that, you know, I'm going to have digital services up under me. I'm going to need those folks that are on top of technology and being able to move and adapt very quickly. And then when I look across the department, I don't know what I have. I don't know who I can tap into, but that long-term planning, just it's, I think it's important so you have the right skill sets because I'm already thinking that I already know I'm going to do some hackathons, I already know there's some things coming up, and that around digital services and the projects, and, I'm, and, and I need to figure out, do I have the right people that I can tap into the department, or do I need to go out and hire them um, and bring them in? I guess when you're looking outside of your day-to-day -day jobs, what are, who are the people um, you're looking to, by example, um, is it the private sector when you're talking about health and data and, and sort of that whole ball of wax? Or? I, <laughs> the individuals I look towards most are those that are going to show the long-term impacts on healthcare and society. Um, Dean Kamen is one of those individuals. He's done a really good job to move things forward in uh, the biosensing sphere along with working at home as well as in hospitals to revolutionize the equipment and the capabilities. Um, IBM has done a phenomenal job of how do you analyze things on the back end for the analytics. Uh, Watson is a good f uh, footprint. So there's lots of individuals that have had a lot of play and a lot of organizations who are supporting things um, to do miraculous things in healthcare. But healthcare is a, a very large beast um, within the U.S., not just for the Department of Veterans Affairs. I mean, uh, there's a lot of hoops people have to jump through to be able to get things done. And there's certainly challenges, I guess, as, you, as a plane's taking off and you're putting the parts on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess today, m moving forward, uh, what's like the top challenge on your, on your mind moving forward? Um, I, the top challenge. Um, <laughs> I don't <laughs> know if the there's 30, a top of one. Of the 30. The one. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, part of my challenge overall is is it's just not, you know, the cloud pieces that are happening. You know, I'm already looking at, you know, the architectural roadmap. 
I'm looking at data across the department. We laid out a two-year plan around data, data governance, all the things around data, geospatial, the digital services team. So uh, my challenge is a, a lot of these things are converging and coming together and really paying attention to all the moving pieces and parts so that I know that you know uh, that there's a plan and that a lot of this is lined up so where the rest of the department is are they planning their money what do the investments look like so that as we're moving and you know that the investments are aligning with the technology roadmap so I have probably one big challenge <laughs> made up of many parts but all those things converging and Adam is that a common thing you hear kind of across the board <laughs> absolutely <laughs> you know there's the one challenge that yes we would yeah. love to find the I one challenge one big one. <laughs> yeah um, but getting back to sort of innovation and where that's coming from we find that you know, the leading source of innovation today uh, is coming from open source communities, right? And these are communities of people who are working collaboratively to solve a problem, and they're technologies that are being adopted by the luminaries of our business, right? Google, Facebook, these guys are all built on open source technologies. Mm -hmm. um, so for us to kind of watch those guys and, and to have a hand in them and to help, and sometimes we write a lot of really boring code to make open source technologies consumable, but that's what we do, that's why we're here. Um, watching those, are, it's, it's absolutely amazing to see what's going on. Great, um, and I guess uh, we'll open it up to some questions in a few moments. Um, I'm just wondering uh, if there's standard uh, practices, standard things you guys hold to in sort of your jobs uh, day to day, things that sort of guide the work that you're doing um, and can maybe help with other agencies looking to do the sort of cloud migration adoption process. Hmm. <laughs> Good question, because we're building, we're, the plane's <laughs> taken off, we're putting parts on it. <laughs> from my perspective, it's always keep it simple. The, the best business plan is going to be something less than a page for me. I, I, I'm not going to be able to go to a higher office and show them 5,000 pages of all the background information. We need to keep it simple, make it digestible, and show the cost benefit. Is right. it going to save lives? Is it going to save time? Is it going to save money? Is it about the mission? Are we using yeah. technology to enable the mission? That's what we're about. And is that your, your advice as well? Yeah, focus on the pockets of innovation, right? One of the things that's really coming along today is this concept of microservices, right? Where rather than building this massive SOA stack for, for my entire organization, I'm going to build a little service that does one thing really great, and as I use it more often, I'll scale it out. Um, using that in context with a platform as a service, you can really get to those pockets of innovation and drive what the business actually needs. Mm -hmm. Well, we get to the point, I guess, where we're seeing the end of the government data center. Is that is that going to end or is... No. <laughs> no. Never going to end. Yeah. yeah, that's part of what I'm looking at as well because as you're looking at data center consolidation, that if I'm looking out and I already know that, you know, we've got six applications that are moving to the cloud in 18 or 24 months, the data center consolidation team needs to know about it because guess what? They're going to lose racks out of their data center and their footprint's going to start shrinking. So that's another one more thing to pay attention to as, as we're doing the longer term planning. And scalability in that is going to be key mm -hmm. for us, at least. Again, large footprint, not everything's going to be in the web. Not everything's going to be outside our four walls. We're going to have to maintain some information inside, some business critical information, as we talked about healthcare information, proprietary. Um, so as we keep doing that, we may reduce a footprint, but I've then got to be careful of how do I put caching services locally so that they can actually get at the information mm -hmm. in a timely fashion. And Adam, I guess, go back to the notion of community cloud, um, and I guess hybrid is, is what I'm hearing here, right? Is that, yeah. is that right? So uh, hybrid is sort of the idea of using a public and a private cloud, but a community cloud is more the idea of, we've got some shared resources, we have some shared constraints, we have some shared goals. What if we invest together and sort of have this community cloud? A great example is Amazon C2S, right? You've got the intelligence community, they got some money together, they've got this great contract with Amazon, and it's really for that community. Um, I think we're gonna see more and more of that. I think that you know, it, it falls in line with sort of the idea of the shared service providers that already exist within the federal government. Those are the organizations that are tooled up for, how do I exchange funds between disparate agencies? That seems, I think we all know, that's pretty difficult, right? They've got it figured out, right? USDA knows how to get money from one agency in order to provide a service. Um, so I think those are gonna be some pretty interesting community clouds as we move forward. And being budget-minded, I guess, matters. Um, are there other things, I guess, energy uh, efficiencies that take top considerations in your mind outside of just the dollars and cents of it all? Uh, I need things that are going to be efficient to my end users and to my customers. Yeah. yeah. 
And is that what you're saying to your customers as well? So yeah, I think that you know the the glut of uh, sort of data center sprawl and the impact of not being able to get enough power. Right. If 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 an agency isn't able to respond to congressional regulation because they can't get more power into the data center, that's a big problem, right? So we need to make sure that the things that we're doing are sort of working in a, in a, a way that we're gonna be able to scale power, space, heat, cooling. You can have the biggest data center in the world, but if you can't cool it, um, you can't start up a single server. Outside of your agency, um, when you're talking to other leaders in government, what are you hearing, I guess, just sort of across the board um, in your day-to-day -day conversations? Any things you can take away from other agencies, lessons you've learned sort of outright just in talking to other people? Yeah, I've, you know, having been on the FedRAMP program, you know, I got to meet people all across the government as well as the cloud providers, and I'm trying to tap into what's working. You know, when you look at work that you know, HHS is doing, USDA, some of the other agencies just across the board. If I hear about they're doing something, I'm gonna call them, I'll send them a note and say, how did you do that? You know, there's one agency that, that already built out a sandbox and I've already reached out to them and said, how did you do it? How much money did you put on it? How are you bringing people in so that, you know, you don't have to pay for it yourself all the time because they, it, they took their own money to do it, you know, but they're expecting their, you know, customers across that agency to help pay for that sandbox. So I'm, I'm trying to pull a lot of those practices and say, okay, what's working, what's not? So that as I'm building out you know, what we're doing at transportation, I can leverage what's working across the board. And is collaboration, I mean, obviously, yes, it is key, but. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're, we're working with a lot of other organizations. I mean, the DOD obviously is a, a big partner of ours right now and has always been. And again, a good portion of our employees are veterans themselves. So it becomes very easy for them to reach across and talk with other agencies. And again, the veteran community within government is rather strong as well. I guess to individual sectors mm -hmm. of sort of cloud strategy, I mean, DevOps is one particularly I think the public sector can learn lessons from from private. Um, what's that back and forth like, that reciprocal relationship where, you know, dev and test, maybe that's sort of taking place now in government, but it's been going on for a while privately. Yeah, DevOps is not a skew. It's not something you can buy, right? DevOps is a cultural shift within mm -hmm. your organization about how the IT organization is going to sort of interoperate. Um, you know, we just, uh, within uh, the Red Hat Public Sector Organization, we just read the Phoenix Project. We actually have a, a meeting that we go to. and we, we have a book club session. Uh, and it was all based around the Phoenix Project, which I, which I recommend to you guys. If anyone sort of within the IT industry will recognize the stories of the Phoenix Project, and it's about how, as an organization, they had to change and sort of adapt um, in order to respond to the needs of their customer. And sort of the Phoenix Project was bringing them out of the ashes. Um, I think we all sort of feel that way sometimes with the projects we're working on. Um, so it's cultural. Yeah, I know over at the DHS, Mark Schwartz, who's the CIO at USCIS, he is really driving agile and really pushing hard on, you know, very quickly deploying and moving things. He's doing a lot of work in that space. So those are the kind of people you want to tap into and say, how's it going? How's it working? What do you, and being able to pull that information back and learn from it. And then role to change your policies, your funding capabilities, it's very difficult to change those quickly. So if you've got to change a policy and you've got to work with your chief financial officer to then figure out how to allocate money differently, a lot of your cloud endeavors don't start out with, okay, well, here's a project, here's a contract, it's going to be $5 million this year, it's going to be $10 million next year, it's going to be $15 million the year after. Uh, they don't work that way. Right. It's a lot more dynamic allocations, a lot more flexibility is needed, and you may find the killer apps out there and it costs $10,000, but you've got to, uh, again, implement things in such a way that the people with the ideas can rise to the top quickly and, again, get the support and the infrastructure behind them. Because if I've got a medical doctor that's spending his nights when he's not seeing patients developing an app, that he expects to move to a mobile platform or a cloud platform, how do we support him and how do we get him to understand the data governance that we've put in over the past 20 years? Yeah. <laughs> and to be very quickly, you know, to very quickly be able to, to procure cloud services. Right now, like you said, we're in that, okay, I have a contract for a year and it's for X amount of dollars. Well, what if I don't use that X amount of dollars because I'm not using all the capability? Well, okay, I spent that money, but what if I use it all up in six months because I'm adding more capabilities well then, in, you know, cloud and using cloud, why can't it be like flipping a switch and you pay for your electricity, you know, um, and being able to provision as you go and, and 
and I think some of the acquisition makes that um, challenging. I think so, my, this will be my final question, is really uh, around the team aspect. I'm wondering if you can talk to the team that you're working with now and what you are looking for in people to kind of be on that, that team itself. What are the key innovation uh, skill sets you need there? Energy, innovative, <laughs> um, you know, understanding the, 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 the realm of possibilities. You know, I'm about possibilities. What's the opportunity? What can we do? What's in the realm of possible? You know, and that's the kind of energy I'm looking for in people to be able to, you know, forward think about where they're headed and, hey, what if we did this? Can we do this? How do we do it? So I need those kind of people with the, the ideas and the energy. I want somebody who's going to be able to follow their passion with that type of energy. Mm -hmm. However, it, it's a difficult balance because you need somebody who can also understand that government does not operate like private business. Government does not operate like education. Government doesn't operate like anyone else. So you've got to come and understand the culture while you're still trying to drive the direction. And that's a, a difficult concept to get sometimes. It really burns out people quickly because they hit a brick wall too many times and then they yeah. kind of go, well, I'm not being effective. Well, it, the, the pace is different. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So yeah. come there's, in with it. <laughs> yeah, there's just a lot of, you know, working in the federal government, there are so many opportunities to do really cool stuff. But to your point, being able to just understand sometimes there's some roadblocks, let your boss deal with the roadblocks and trying to work through it, but yet allow your people to, to, to really to be innovative and be creative. And, and stay and, excited. And, and stay excited because I, I, there's just so many things you can do. It's not, I'm going to work for the federal government. Look at the cool things you can do. I mean, like for healthcare right now in the VA, we're bleeding edge. We mm -hmm. don't do things like private industry because private industry is always figuring out what service can I charge for? We, our goal is to make sure veterans stay healthy. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a, a great ideal goal as, a, as an Air Force officer myself, uh, to, to know that I can try to influence it to take care of my battle body, take care of everyone I've deployed with and everybody I've interacted with, and not have to say, okay, well, I'm gonna bill you a copay, and then I'm gonna bill services, and then I've got this insurance company, and then I've got that. I, I don't have that business balance as much. I can drive right for the mission goal, right for the source, and try to keep that as your primary focus. Oh, we're short on time, but I want to get to some Twitter questions very quickly. Um, the first one I really like here, uh, I think you guys can speak to this. How challenging is it to work in your organization to broach cloud as viable solutions when there's internal pushback? I don't know that I'm seeing the pushback so much other than um, looking for help. How do I do this? What's the best way to do it? You've got people that already moved to the cloud and off they went. but. Um, I, some of the challenges, I think, probably around security where people mm -hmm. aren't comfortable in that space. That's probably the biggest one I've seen. The, the security is a big question for the way we operate. It, it panics a lot of people quickly. So talking them down is the easiest way and showing them how it can work. And then the challenges get to be more of the long, along the lines of your future planning. How do I keep these projects on track? How do I allow innovation, fail fast, fail quickly, and learn your lessons quickly? Mm -hmm. And Adam, I think this is a good question for you. So how do you plan strategically with your vendor sort of as you move along in the, the whole process there? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think that right now, um, some agencies have this idea of I'm gonna build a cloud and, and wait for the workload so that if you build it, they will come mentality, which um, do. How's that working? Yeah, yeah, sometimes they do, usually they don't. Um, and so I think it's key that you partner with industry and you start, you partner with your lines of business, right? And together, collaboratively, you go in and say, okay, we're solving this problem, we're working together, we're gonna move this forward. Um, that's where you'll really find success. To touch on the previous topic really quickly, um, if, if you're the one creating resistance within your organization, you're probably going to be resisting yourself out of a role because <laughs> organizations, this concept of shadow IT, they're going around the IT organization if you're not being responsive and they will go find a solution to their problem, right? And I don't know if you guys are seeing that in your agencies. Red Hat said that. <laughs> <laughs> Disclaimer, right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess responding broadly or th broadly to that, do you, th is that sort of the end all be all then? Is that the future? Like Again, I grew up in IT business in the 80s and 90s, and I always bring up a, uh, a good point to people who are in IT today. In the 90s, the I average IT systems engineer and architect said no far more often than they said yes. In 98, 99, when Y2K was buttoned up pretty good, 
the average IT person who said no find them, found themselves out of a job. Today, the IT person who doesn't say yes and say, I will help you find that, will probably find themselves out of a job quicker rather than later. The doctor said that. <laughs> yes. well, so on that note, I'm going to conclude here and just say thank you guys for this great conversation. It was really fun uh, to sit down and chat with all of you. Um, for those who are watching, just a reminder that we will email this out to you tomorrow, and you'll have a link that you'll be able to share. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon.